So this is Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number four in that series. The title of this lesson this morning is The Giant Killer, David and Goliath. And if you're following along in your Bibles, open up at 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And as always, I will be putting the passages up on the screen. Let me start with a question here on this particular theme. Uh, what does it take to be a champion or a winner? Talk a lot about that in our sports mad country. Some say it's a combination of you know, skill and luck to be a winner. Uh, perhaps to be a winner you have to be good at something, work hard, be at the right place at the right time. You know, these are the things that I hear a lot of times when they talk to elite athletes or champions. You know, they kind of describe the hard work they've done, so on and so forth. Of course, not everything is, uh, in life is about sports. What about winning a war? Or winning over discouragement? What about winning over illness or loneliness? What about winning over fear or bad habits or dangerous situations? You know, those are challenges as well that we try to win over. You see, sometimes ordinary people like you and I, we, uh, we have to face extraordinary challenges uh, in our lives, you know, kind of make or break situations. So in the lesson today, lesson from the Kings today, I want to tell you a story about a little guy, a nobody, who faced a great challenge and who won. And of course, this is the story of you know, David and Goliath, pretty, a pretty familiar story. So let's, uh, let's set up the scene, shall we? The scene for the story, a story, as I said before, you're pretty familiar with. Hopefully, we'll kind of draw some lessons uh, from it that uh, you may not have thought of before. So let's set the scene. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. It says, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succo, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Succo and Azekah in Ephiv's Damim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Now we need to understand, of course, that the Philistines for a long, long period of time were the arch enemies of the uh, Israelites. The, uh, the Philistines lived along the coast with the Mediterranean Sea on one side and the Israelites on the other. And of course there was always pressure to expand their territory by attacking their neighbors, which were the Jews. They had nowhere to go on one side, that was the sea. There was only one other side to expand their territory and that was uh, where Israel uh, was uh, situated. In addition to this, the natural pressure, the Bible says that God often used the Philistine nation to punish the Israelites in the form of military campaigns, because as we know of the history of the Israelites, they were unfaithful and they were disobedient. And so many times God used the Philistine nation to, to punish them. When Saul, the first king of Israel, was anointed, uh, many of his military campaigns were with the Philistines as he tried to kind of push them back into their territory. When he succeeded, there would be peace. Now this period of peace did not last long since Saul himself disobeyed God and the Lord roused the Philistines to once again come and attack Israel. And this time they had a new secret weapon. This is the situation we find as we begin reading chapter 17 in the book of Samuel. You notice that the writer describes that the opposing armies were grouped on two ridges facing each other and they had to go down into a valley in order to fight. Now this was a feature of ancient warfare that opposing armies, they would face one another, they would examine each other, they would taunt each other before entering into combat. Today we call it talking trash. You know, they talk trash to each other, you know, put each other down. That's what normally preceded the battle in those days. So this is the scene before us as we see the Philistines roll out their new secret weapon. And the new secret weapon 
was a champion fighter called Goliath. So let's keep reading. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was clothed with scale armor which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield carrier also walked before him. So I want you to imagine you know, in an age where there were no true long range weapons, where the majority of the fighting at war was hand to hand combat, try to imagine how intimidating this, this uh, Goliath was. I mean, in a time where men's average height and weight, the average height and weight was, of a man was five foot six, perhaps 150 pounds, Goliath was 10 feet tall, 10 feet tall. He weighed 400 pounds. He carried 125 pounds of armor. His spear was 12 feet long. The tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. Can you imagine if just the tip of the spear weighs 15 pounds? He even had someone else carry his shield. So this was the, the weapon that they unveiled on this battlefield, a giant champion superior to any man in any army. Now I think you're all familiar with the psychological warfare. They talk about that a lot, psych psychological warfare. Things that you do to psych out the, the enemies. In World War II they used to drop pamphlets down on the enemy telling them to surrender, telling them you know, you know, if you surrender you know, you'll, you'll have this and that and we won't hurt you or whatever else. You know, I remember uh, uh, hearing about Tokyo Rose. You know, this was a woman, who, a Japanese woman who spoke uh, English very well and they would broadcast Tokyo Rose to the allies who were out in the field at the time uh, at war and she would play music, you know, American music to make the soldiers feel nostalgic and she would be telling them you're not going to win, you might as well give up, how about going home for Christmas, you know, psychological, psychological warfare. So as I say, this type of approach, nothing new. Armies were using it thousands of years ago and the Bible records a prime example of psychological warfare in this story. So let's keep reading. It says, he stood and shouted to the, this is uh, Goliath, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do you come out to draw, uh, why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So every day, think about it now, every day Goliath, the massive Philistine champion, comes out and he challenges someone from the Israelite side to come out and fight one-on-one, -on -one, man to man, winner take all. Whoever wins becomes master, whoever loses becomes slave. With one contest, the Israelite nation could lose its freedom. In verse 16 of this passage, it says that this taunting, this trash talk, goes on every single day, morning and night, for 40 days. 40 days. In the morning, basically, the, the, the Goliath is coming out and saying, you people are chicken, fraidy cats, send me somebody to fight. And then at night, the same challenge. Morning and night, morning and night, 40 days in a row. Talk about mind games. I mean, who could fight the giant? Now what's worse is that each day as the giant came out to taunt them, other nations were getting the news that the great nation of Israel, God's people, were being humiliated and defeated by a single man, just one man. I mean, talk about an army of one. Of course, what was really happening was that every single day as Goliath came forth to successfully face them down, 
the Israelite army could feel their courage and their self-esteem shrinking as their fear and shame grew since none dared to answer the call of the giant except one person and his name was David. David, the challenger. Now in verses 12 to 24, the writer introduces a new character on the scene as the story shifts gears. David, as we know, the youngest of eight sons of Jesse, he wasn't permitted to go to the battle, he had to stay home to take care of his father's sheep. As the youngest, his father uses David as a kind of a messenger boy, you know, to bring food and to get information from his other sons who were at the front lines. David was a teenager at this time. So at this point, David is a shepherd boy, not aware of the great challenge that will face him the next time he goes on an errand to the battlefront for his father. And in the next section, we see a transformation take place in David's life. We continue to read, we see the things that happen to transform this humble shepherd boy into one of the greatest heroes and winners. You know, we talked about the, at the beginning, how do you become a winner? How do you become a hero? Uh, we, if we observe David's life and transformation, we get some clues on how that happens. So first of all, David hears and he accepts the challenge. You know, we're talking about transformation here. So his transformation from shepherd boy to hero begins here. And it begins with the fact that he actually understands what's going on. So let's read verse 25. It says, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him in accordance to, his wor to this word saying, thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger burned against David and he said, why have you come down? And with, whom have you, uh, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. So by now, you know, the uh, army is visibly afraid. Another day or so and the Philistines will just cross the valley and destroy them all. Notice that his brothers are angry that he is there to witness their shame. That's why they're angry. They're embarrassed and their little brother is seeing their inaction and embarrassment. Now if you caught it in the very first verse that I read in this section, it says that the king was offering a reward for someone to go up and fight the giant. Actually, he's offering a position in the royal family and the money to fit into the royal family. That's, that's the reward. Now what's really going on is that Saul, the king, is desperately looking for someone to do what he should be doing. He's the leader, he's the king, he's the one anointed by God. He's the one that should go to God and say, look, you know, I'm the king, I'm, I'm going to go forward. But he's looking for somebody else to do it. And if you read this whole passage, you'll see that not in, not in one of the passages does Saul ask God for help. Nowhere in, in this story does Saul go to God and say, Lord, what, what do we do? How, you know, how can we face the giant? Nowhere does he, uh, does he do this. So we see that David, he hears and he accepts the real challenge, really what's going on. He doesn't just hear the words, he's able to see exactly what the problem is. So David recognizes that the insult isn't against the army or even against King Saul or the nation of Israel. The insult is against God himself because if you insult God's army or God's king, who do you insult? Well, you're insulting God. So he gets that. And so David's transformation begins with a vision, an understanding of what the true problem is and how serious the problem is. 
The second step in David's transformation, he decides to do something. Verse 31, it says, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And so what happens here? David reacts not with fear, but with righteous indignation, holy anger. Today we would say, well, this is so wrong. This is wrong in so many ways that this man is standing here insulting the armies of God, the God's king, God's people, and nobody is doing anything. This is wrong. So he gets it. He gets it. Righteous indignation. It was so wrong to insult God and somebody had to do something. Somebody had to go out and shut this guy up. So David decided that, that if no one else was going to, he would do something about it. And this brings us to the third most important step in David's transformation. He saw the problem, he decides to do something, and then he puts his confidence in God for victory. Let's read verse 33. It says, then Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. So David is basically saying, he's faced danger and death from wild animals while guarding his sheep and he had defeated them with his bare hands. And he had spent many lonely nights by himself in the mountains, and these had given him a lot of time to be with God and to know God and to, to trust Him for protection. And basically, a great argument says, what's, what's the difference? A lion, a bear, or this Philistine animal? You know, I've taken on all kinds of animals. So David would risk his life, he'd go down into the valley to fight, and he was ready for battle because the transformation from shepherd boy to warrior was complete. First, he was right. Insulting God was wrong and this guy had to be put down because rightness gives you power. Rightness gives you power. It is empowering when you know that you are right. He was set. Action was needed and he made the decision to act. You know, so many people, they whine and complain and so on and, so, and criticize instead of taking action. And he was confident. He knew that his victory would come from God, not himself or his strength, so he went into battle with confidence. You see, transformations occur in our lives when we make up our minds to do what is right, and trust God for the strength to complete what is right. And so we've gone from the, you know, the transformation complete, let's go now to the victory. And so the story shifts back now to the scene of battle. Verse 38, it says, Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. So at first, King Saul, of course, gives David conventional armor and sword and helmet, but the equipment proves to be too bulky, untested by David. It's not something he's used before. He chooses to fight with his own weapon, which is the shepherd's sling. You know, a primitive slingshot, if you were, where you, know, you swing the rock over your head and release it. These were deadly, very accurate, up to about 100 feet. Again, the, the battle in those days was at close quarters. And this is how he had killed many of the animals. 
We go ahead, verse 41, it says, Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. Isn't it interesting that in the middle of the battle, the writer goes on to describe that David happened to be good looking. You know, young guy, but good looking guy. Anyways, goes on, verse 43, and the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. So David and Goliath go down into the valley. They confront each other. They're like you know, two prize fighters trying to psych each other out. You ever watch boxing? And you know, when they, before the fight starts, the, 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 the two fighters come and they face each other and the referee is reading, you know, you know, uh, watch yourselves at all time, no low punches, you know, and the trainers are back there rubbing, massaging their backs, and you see the two fighters, they're just looking at each other, into each other's eyes, you know, and they're trying to psych each other out. This is going on here. They're trying to psych each other out. Goliath, of course, is angry that the Israelites have sent a, a mere boy with no weapons to fight him. He curses David, he threatens to kill him and give his body to the animals to, to eat. Listen to what David says. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Boy, talk about, <laughs> talk about trash talk. You know? I mean, Goliath says, I, I'm going to rip you up, and I'm going to feed your body to the birds. You know, it was you know, pretty scary stuff for a big guy. Then David comes back and said, boy, not, any, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to cut your head off and feed you to the animals. And not only that, all of your army is going to be fed to the animals. You know, it's like they're one upsmanship as far as the, 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 the trash talk is, uh, is concerned. So uh, David's not afraid. He pronounces a curse on him, but a judgment on Goliath in the name of the Lord. He tells him that because he insulted the Lord, both he and his armies will be defeated by the Lord. This is exactly why a teenager with no weapons was sent, to show where the power was really coming from. And that's, isn't that how God works? He doesn't raise up huge armies, he, he, he picks small things, humble things, foolish things to confound the wise. Isn't that his style? Let's keep reading, 48 uh, to 52. Uh, not read it rather, but just confirm it. We know the story. David had five stones, but he only needed one. A lot of speculation, why five? Some, some say, well, you know, he knew that Goliath had other brothers, you know, and he had the other stones for the other brothers. I don't know. We do know he knocks the giant out with his first shot and then jumps on him, cuts, cuts off his head with his own sword. Talk about humiliation. That's like being shot with your own weapon. And when Goliath's men see what has happened, that their secret weapon has been defeated, they lose courage and they run. And they're chased back to their border by the jubilant um, um, Israelites and their army. So an interesting thing about this, uh, this story, <clears throat> literary historians, not, not biblical historians, literary historians, those who study ancient literature, Literary historians tell us that this story is the basis for every you know, Rocky type story and movie. You know, Rocky, the boxing movie with Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester Stallone. You know, the idea of the little guy, the underdog, winning against great odds. Well, literary historians tell us that this story is the basis for every Rocky type movie or book. Every story where the little guy takes on the big guy and wins, this is this is the source material where all of those stories come from.
But this story is special because it also teaches us what it takes to win spiritual and emotional and social battles, not just sporting events. In David's case, he defeated the giant because first of all, because he was a child of God and Goliath was not. I mean, that was the real difference between Goliath and David. Not size, not strength, it was who they were. Goliath was a pagan, a blasphemer, he was a sinner. David was one of God's chosen people, a believing, obedient, holy child of God, even anointed to be future king. You know, power to overcome is given because of our relationship with God, not our personal strength. All the working out in the gym doesn't help if God is not your helper. So that, that story, this story rather, uh, teaches that in a very dynamic, uh, in a very dynamic way. Uh, David defeated Goliath because he was zealous for God. You know, the word zealous, another word for jealous. It means that the things of God are important to you. So David respected the things and the person of God. He was concerned about an insult to God and an insult to God's people. That, you know, that spoke to him. You ought not to do that. This zeal you know, is what inflamed his courage to go out and fight, even if he was outmatched. He was, he was outmatched physically, but he wasn't outmatched spiritually. Spiritually, he was pumped. It's the quality that moved Noah to build the boat. It's the quality of character John the Baptist had to go and preach. It was the quality of the, of the spirit of Jesus uh, 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 that led him to the cross for our sins. And the apostles to risk their lives preaching the gospel. Zeal is that quality that separates those who are just fooling around for Christ from those who are becoming fools for Christ. Big difference, big difference. David was a fool for God because only a fool, a zealous fool, would go fight a giant barehanded. Only a fool would do that. Only a fool for God takes on the giant Goliath in life. And then finally, David won because he had confidence in God. You know, the Philistine relied on size and strength alone. David relied on God for his size and strength. David knew from experience that the Lord saves those who call upon him, and this gave him confidence to face his great enemy. David was confident because with the God of salvation on his side, he could not even imagine losing. How can I lose? All right, so now you have the story of David and Goliath, an event that took place you know, some 3,000 years ago. Let's bring the battle into the 21st century, shall we? Let's see if it's relevant to us today by asking the following question, because remember this series is called Lessons from the Kings. All right, so what's the lesson for us Who's your Goliath? That's the lesson. Who's your Goliath? Every person has his or her own personal Goliath facing them every day. Worry, bad habits, family problems, fear of death, money issues, problems dealing with intimacy, sexual intimacy, whatever. You see, every day our own personal Goliath gets up with us in the morning and challenges us to come out and fight. And every night he taunts us for having refused. Let me ask you, when it comes to your personal Goliath, and we're not going to take a, you know, we could go around and ask. And I am confident that every single person, including me, could name their Goliath. Hey, 
I'm sure some of us could name three or four Goliaths. Some people could say, I'm surrounded by Goliaths. Let me ask you, when it comes to your own personal Goliath, are you winning? Have you cut off his head yet? Or are you like Saul, shrinking back in fear, paralyzed by his size and power over you? Question is, do you want to be a giant killer? So I've got some good news for you. You can be a victor today. The challenge and the victory, it came in one day for David. And it can come in one day for us as well. Here's where to start. The obvious, of course. Become a child of God. You can't defeat Goliath unless you are a child of God and you become a a child of God when you're born again by repenting of your sins and being baptized in the name of Christ. We know this, but I, in the context of this lesson, it's very important to remind people that this is the first step in overcoming any of those Goliaths. Secondly, you become zealous for God. Become a fool for God in your good conduct and your attitude and your Bible study and your worship and your efforts to bring others to Christ. Because zeal for God generates courage and courage moves us into the arena to fight our own personal Goliaths. You know, get in there, don't be afraid to do your best, to be foolish, to go overboard. Never mind if the world will say, oh, he's why, you know, religious, this guy is a little too religious. Don't worry about them. You know, I don't think God ever accused one of his children of being overly religious. This is not a, an accusation that God makes to us. This is, Jesus doesn't accuse us of being, oh, you're just a little too religious. Oh, you're just a little too overzealous for, for me. He never says that. He never says that. Who says that? Well, that's the world that says that. Who are we trying to please here? Who are we trying to impress? The world or God? And you will cut off his head if you absolutely trust in God for the final victory. If God can create a billion stars, each larger than the earth itself. If God can create a human life from the dust of the ground, surely, he can give you the strength to take care of a few puny giants. The final victory may be long in coming, but when you put your trust in God, you know that the first and most crucial step towards victory has been taken. You know that song, I'm on my way to Canaan's land, you know, I'm on my way. We could change the words of that and it could be, I'm on my way to victory. I don't know if such a song exists, but it should be written. I'm on my way to victory. I'm not there yet maybe, but I know that I'm on my way to my own personal victory. And the final victory may be long in coming as I say, but when you put your trust in God, you know that you're on your way to that final victory. So make sure you know how to be a victor. Make sure that you, uh, this day, uh, become one who can overcome the giants in your life. All right, so those are some of the lessons from uh, uh, David and Goliath, from King David, ultimately became King uh, David. Uh, next week we're going to look at a kind of a love story some of the lessons we can draw from a, a wonderful love story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible and, Bible, and that's uh, David and Abigail. Great, great, great love story and marvelous lessons from this, uh, from this particular episode. And that's it for today, thank you very much.